Good morning. My name is Ben Mandrell, as he said. I'm the president of Lifeway Christian Resources. Great to be with you. And just a quick word of thank you for all that you do to support Lifeway, for doing VBS with us and doing Bible studies and Bibles and all the stuff that you do. I get the joy of representing a, a team of very creative people that create stuff that helps churches fulfill their mission. So it's a joy to be here today. Uh, my family is joining me uh, later today, but I want to show a quick picture of them just so you get to know me. This is my wife, Lindley, and our four teenagers, Ava, Max, Miles, and Jack. So yeah, I have four teenagers. Put me on your prayer card, if you don't mind. And we, we live in Nashville, and I have the joy. I've been the president of Lifeway for two years, and it's, it's a joy to fill in today for what I feel is one of the most humble and kind pastors across our nation, Greg Ma, and it's just a joy to fill in for him today as he gets some time of rest. So if you brought a Bible, turn to Nehemiah chapter four, or you can follow along on the screen uh, for me. I've been asked to speak on the subject of walking by faith, and the Lord led me to this great Old Testament passage, uh, and the title of my message is Walking by Faith When the Naysayers Come. I hope it'll be relevant to you. I, um, in my high school years, was playing basketball. I came around a screen, fell onto the floor, and dislocated my kneecap. It was the most acute pain that I've ever felt in my life, uh, just piercing pain, if you've ever dislocated anything. I don't think about the pain of that moment very often in my 44-year-old self. I don't rehearse it a lot. I don't think about it a lot. It doesn't come to my mind a lot. And yet I still remember and rehearse criticism that I've received over my life on a regular basis. It still hurts. It still has a residual effect. Um, it makes me wonder, what is it about us as human beings that we care so much about what strangers think? I heard a pastor say one time that success is when the people who know you the best respect you the most. If we only lived by that, and it seems in our day and age, in our culture, that we spend a lot of time worrying about what people think about us who hardly even know us and who really don't have access to the full story about us or the narrative. And I think this passage of scripture is very relevant for us today because sometimes God calls us to walk by faith when he calls us to a great task and, and it draws criticism. And if you've ever tried to lead anything, lead a family, lead a classroom, lead a school, lead a church, lead a Sunday school class, whatever you try to lead, if you ever try to lead anything, you know that when you start leading, you start getting criticism. And it's one of the most difficult things uh, to deal with in ministry. And so I wanna just walk you through this passage and all that God taught, taught me through this story of Nehemiah and what he faced when he was trying to rebuild this wall around Jerusalem. But just let me just ask you, don't you love it when critical people show up in your life? Aren't they a blessing? I looked up the definition of naysayer, and, and online somebody defined it like this. I thought it was great. A naysayer is one who frequently engages in excessive complaining, negative banter, and or a genuinely poor and downbeat attitude. Naysayers are distinguished by their tendency to consistently view the glass half empty, making, I love this, frequent one-way trips to negative town. <laughs> Do you have anybody in your life right now? Like, picture the person. You got them, right? There's somebody like that that's in your life. And I think Paul had one of those. I think it was his thorn in the flesh. He never tells us what that was. You know, God has given to me to keep me from becoming conceited, a thorn in my flesh. It just wouldn't go away. I think it was a naysayer. Because it's people like this that God puts in our life. It keeps us humble. Uh, it reminds us of our need of the gospel. It keeps us um, from becoming conceited. And yet, they're difficult to deal with. If you've seen National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, you remember that scene. You got to remember it. When Clark has finally put the, the 20,000 imported twinkling lights on the roof, it's like a fishnet around his house. He finally gets the power working. The family comes out, this glorious act of splendor. And there it is in all of its glory. And you remember that moment. His father-in-law slides over. Remember this moment? I think I have the image of it. And he says, the little lights aren't twinkling. And I love Clark's response. He says, I know art and thanks for noticing. <laughs> I think everybody has that person in their life that we want to say, I know and thanks for noticing. They wear a no face. They wake up with a no on their face. Have you noticed this? They just automatically say no to everything. Everything's a bad idea. Anything you throw out there, there's a problem with it. We're going to troubleshoot that. And when you have people like that in your life, and you will, 
you can easily get distracted from the calling that God has put upon your life. And I think this passage is so relevant. Quick background, let me get chapters one through three under our belt so we know what's happening in four. In chapter one, Nehemiah discovers that the wall around his treasured ancient city of Jerusalem is in shambles. It's, it's a mockery to the Jews. And in chapter two, he begins dreaming, what would it be like if God called me to go and repair it? And he begins thinking, okay, if God brought the resources, here's how I would do it. He draws up the list, the plan, the resources. Chapter three, he gets permission, green light from the king to go and do that. That's the most miraculous part of the story. And then chapter four, he gets there. They start building the wall. It's going really well until Art shows up. And there's this moment where he has to make a decision whether he's going to focus on negativity and get distracted by the detractor or whether he's going to focus on the mission of rebuilding this wall. Now watch what happens in the first six verses of chapter four. Let me read it to you. When Sanballat, who is one of the critics, heard that we were rebuilding this wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria. And he said, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? And then Tobiah the Ammonite, another small-minded man, jumps in who was beside him said, indeed, even if a fox climbed up to what they're building, he would break down their stone wall. And Nehemiah breaks out into a prayer. He says, listen, our God, for we are despised. Make their insults return on their own heads. Let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight because they have angered the builders. So we rebuilt that wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the Lord had the will, for the people had the will to keep on working. I want you to notice first one that Nehemiah catches flack just as soon as the project has the possibility of actually being completed. It goes from pipe dream to possibility and that's when he starts to catch uh, flack. Uh, the word angry there, when it says that Sanballat became angry, it means that he was stoked into a fire. He was greatly incensed, he was kindled. And we learned some principles here about leadership and about what it means to uh, fulfill the calling of God in our lives. And the first one is, is that when naysayers come, we have to remind ourselves that it's the success that will draw the opposition. Jesus said this, woe to you when all men speak well of you. That when, when you start to achieve anything for the will of God, by, by nature, it's going to draw the opposition of the enemy. We know that there is a great enemy. He's on the prowl. And his greatest desire is to destroy anything that's, that is reflecting the glory of God. And so he's going to come against anyone or any person or any church or any institution that's beginning to advance the kingdom of God. So as we experience success in ministry, as we're doing the things that God has called us to do, we get a target on our back, scripturally speaking, New Testament, and we begin to experience the assault of the enemy. And that often comes through people who are not filled with the Holy Spirit, throwing rocks and casting stones. And so it says in verse one that, that this man, Sanballat, was stirred up once he saw that the project was actually underway and he was, he was threatened by the success of another person. Now let's just be honest with ourselves and recognize that we all do this. Uh, this isn't something that is outside of us. All of us feel envious when other people experience success. It's the green-eyed monster. And it actually starts in like middle school and it always continues into adulthood. It always does. It's just we've sanitized it and made it more respectable. So in middle school, it starts something as simple as, you know, why does Luke get all the attention? Why does everyone think he's so funny? And then you go into high school and it's, why does David get the ball all the time? Why is he the star player on the team? If I got to shoot 25 times in a game, I'd be the leading scorer, ball hog. And then we get into college and we wonder, why does, why does this guy get all the female attention? No one's knocking on my door. And then we get into adult years and we say, why does the guy across the hallway or the gal across the hallway get the promotion when I'm over here grinding and out and always paying attention? We just can't help ourselves but be envious when other people are having greater success than us when we're not in the front of the pack. And social media has been such a blessing in this way. <laughs> you notice that? Isn't it great to see how awesome other people's lives are? 
And so when the tables are turned and we're on the receiving end of success and we're the one getting promoted or we have a great marriage or we have a great kid or, or something spectacular happens in our lives, just know that the very green-eyed monster that lives within you lives with everybody else too. And when you experience success, when God shows you favor, just be prepared for the fact not everybody's gonna be your biggest fan. Even your church, let's take Houston's first. Let's say Greg comes off sabbatical, he's red hot on fire, the Holy Spirit has come upon him in the wilderness. And he comes back, he starts preaching sermons, people start showing up, not an empty seat in the house, people come in the flood, just flooded at the altar, conversions, baptisms, people are being called to ministry, to missions, like this becomes like the hot spot for kingdom work in all of Texas. Do you think that all the churches and all the Christians in Texas would wonder, man, that is just the greatest thing I've ever heard. I'm just gonna celebrate all that God's doing at Houston's First. It has not been my experience that we as Christians are any better than non-believing people in celebrating the successes of others. Because we all have depravity. And so what happens here is Nehemiah is experiencing success and the success that we see in others brings out the worst inside of us. Nehemiah was opposed because God was doing a special work in his life. And there's something about naysaying people. They become like this magnetic force for other naysaying people. Birds of a feather flock together, misery loves company. And so Tobiah hops in and I'm sure others and says, even a light-footed animal could cause that wall to crumble. And in principle number two we see here is that we should not return evil for evil or insult for insult. And he, he refuses to do that. Have you ever... You ever done a, 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 pill, a pillow fight? You ever done that? You remember as a kid doing a pillow fight? Kind of starts out fun. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> I'll never quote Tyson in the sermon again. <laughs> anyway, that, that's good. That's good. I remember pillow fights as a middle schooler. Like it starts out kind of fun and comical until you turn around and you get a hot one to the nose. And then it's on. It's a whole nother level of intensity. And there's something within us, it just feels so natural that when we get hit hard, we wanna hit hard. Actually, we wanna hit harder. And if the New Testament and Old Testament come together to say anything that's so clear, is that the only way to defeat a spirit is with the opposite spirit. So it's a general answer that turns away wrath. We, we have to respond to insults and critics and hatred with love and kindness and generosity. And I don't know about you, but outside a really close walk with the Holy Spirit, I'm incapable of such behavior. But Nehemiah does not take a swing at his opponents. In verse four, he takes his frustration and it's toxic, these toxic emotions straight to God. He says, listen, our God, we are despised. Make their insults return on their own heads and let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. I'm not sure his heart was pure in that. I don't think this is a healthy prayer life, but it's an honest one. Uh, After all, um, Nehemiah could have come back with his own swings. He could have launched a blog or opened a Twitter account. He he could have done a lot of things to make his feelings public about these two men because the Bible tells us that Sanballat is the ruler of Samaria. Nobody wants to own that. That's not prized real estate over there in Samaria. He could have taken a shot at him for uh, overseeing an area that nobody else wants to see or Tobiah, we know, is a ruler of desert people. Everybody wants that job. He could have found a way to diminish or uh, throw stones at who Tobiah was or what he was called to do, but he doesn't do that. Instead, Nehemiah takes this approach of just going straight to God and being honest with his feelings of what he wants to do versus what he knows he needs to do. I I love this quote, Eugene Peterson in his... uh, in his message paraphrase, he takes Romans 12, 17 through 21, and he, he says it this way, and it, I think it's challenging. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. 
I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch, or if he's thirsty, give him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. This is the best part. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. If you examine the lives of people throughout Old and New Testament scripture, you see that they apply this principle. You see it in Joseph and Genesis that he refuses to be bitter by being thrown into jail. He refuses to hold a grudge against his brothers. He doesn't become bitter. He becomes better by life's challenges and circumstances. You see David, who uh, is called, anointed to be the next king of Israel, but for 12 years, he's hiding in caves and Saul's throwing javelins at him. And yet he says, I will not lift a hand against the Lord's anointed. It's all in God's timing. And then, of course, you see Jesus, who endured the cross, scorning its shame. So why? So that he could uh, sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. And all through Old and New Testament scripture, you see this principle over and over again. Let God be the judge. To walk by faith means to continue to keep your eyes on God, even when the naysayers come, even when the difficult people come. You don't take your eyes off God, what he's called you to do. It's you and your calling with God that matters. And that's what you're supposed to be focused on. Had a Sunday school teacher guy walk up to me one day. He says, hey, there's one principle I apply over and over with my class. It's just really simple. Whatever you focus on gets bigger. So we talk about that every week. It's so true. Whatever you focus on, it gets bigger. You focus on the goodness of God, like we just sang, the goodness of God gets bigger. You focus on unkind, critical voices, their voices get louder. It's a principle. And so he takes this to the Lord and he's, he's frustrated, Nehemiah. In verse five, he says, Lord, do not cover their guilt. Do not let their sins be erased because they have angered the builders. Uh, he, he's not in a good place. He says, Lord, don't ever forgive their sins. I believe uh, that, that Nehemiah is just basically purging himself of all these toxic emotions because he knows that God's the only one that can heal them. Because as human beings, we don't always respond in the best way. Had a lady come out after the first service. She said, I've got your sermon in a sentence. I heard it long ago. She said, it's easy to act like a Christian. It's very hard to react like a Christian. I said, you should be a preacher. <laughs> She's really good. Remember that moment in the New Testament, uh, Jesus is traveling from place to place as he often did. And um, he walks through Samaria and the Samaritans were not very kind to him. And he just so happens to be traveling with two of his disciples who have the names Sons of Thunder. And after they disrespect Jesus, they propose an idea how to react. They say, Jesus, how about we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? It's a healthy response. Of course, Jesus re rejects that kind of returning evil for evil. Jesus calls us to live a totally counter life than the way that the culture responds to criticism. I believe Nehemiah's prayer is recorded to illustrate the way that we often feel inside when we're unfairly treated and when we want justice. Came across this quote the other day, I found it helpful. When you are not attached to praise and when you are not attached to criticism, an interesting freedom is yours. C.S. Lewis said, one of the great goals of my life is to take my joy and put it beyond the reach of my enemies. And when you don't attach your identity to those who praise you and you don't attach your identity to those who criticize you, there's this interesting freedom. Early on when I became a pastor, a seasoned pastor said to me one day, he said, something you'll need to remember in pastoring, you're not nearly as good as some people think you are and you're not nearly as bad as some people think you are. There's a humility that we should all walk with and Nehemiah was able to process that with God and continue to live his life in humility, which leads us to our third point. Unless the criticism is valid, resume the work. Notice what Nehemiah does after he regains his perspective from, from this time in prayer. He resumes the work. Verse six, so we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people who had the will, the people had the will to keep on working. Notice Nehemiah knew that the best thing to do with criticism was convert it into fuel to finish his, his mission and his calling in life. 
Now, let me just take a time out here and offer a balanced conversation because I think there is a disclaimer to be offered here for being uh, fair to all of the Old and New Testament revelation on this subject. There are a lot of verses in the Bible about how foolish it is to not listen to those who challenge you. There is a side to that conversation that needs to be represented in a sermon like this. So verses like this, for example, uh, Proverbs 12, 15, a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is a wise one. That's a good verse. Proverbs 17, 10, a rebuke cuts into a perceptive person. He allows it to sink in or she allows it to sink in. But even more than a hundred lashes into a fool. A fool won't let a rebuke set in. A fool doesn't listen. The ability to take advice and correction is considered a mark of wise and humble people. And those are the people that God likes to bless. No wonder David exclaims in Psalm 141, verse five, let the righteous one strike me. It's an act of faithful love. Let him rebuke me. It's oil for my head. Let me not refuse it. David knows the, the profit of gaining wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He knows that sometimes critical marks or critical comments are meant to help me and are given to me by God. Sometimes people say the right thing, but with the wrong spirit. And with, when we're walking in the Holy Spirit, we can take that, that grain of truth inside that criticism and use it. It's a, it's a word from the Lord for us, even though it was poorly delivered. And this is all spiritually discerned. This is why it's so important to be walking in the spirit, not in the flesh, because it's all spiritually discerned. In some occasions, the best thing to do is to take criticism seriously. And in other cases, it's best to act as if it never happened. All of this is part of walking closely with the Lord. Nehemiah chooses that, uh, that this advice that he's been given and this distraction is, is not from the Lord. And so he goes back to the focus of finishing the work of the wall. When I was 29, I became a pastor for the first time. I'd never really experienced a lot of criticism. And I was young and had little kids and young wife and we were new at it. And rumors started to be told in our new church about us that were completely untrue, very hurtful. Even a little website that had been started to perpetuate lies about our family. And it, really, it was really getting me down and weighing me down and taking me away from the calling of leading the church. And this elderly woman who had taken us on as I think her project, she started coming over to our house and taking care of our kids and loving on us and she could see what was happening. And I'll never forget the day she pulled my wife and I aside and she said, you listen to me. You don't pay attention to those people. And these words came out of her mouth. We've, we have repeated these words a thousand times in our home. She said, because when you take a little dig, you lose a little ground. And she taught me that people who take little digs, they're the ones that lose the ground. Those who constantly criticize soon find themselves without credibility. This is why scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Leave it to me. And so Nehemiah, he doesn't resort to responding to those who take digs at him, but instead he focuses himself on resuming the work. So with my final few minutes here, let me see if I can make this matter for you on Monday. Here's some, here's some takeaways that I think are simple from this text. Number one, I think I've said this earlier, expect opposition when you walk in the will of God. Expect opposition when you walk in the will of God. So, uh, recently, I heard a TV preacher uh, who was telling a story about how he got on a plane and he was flying coach. And to his surprise, they moved him up to first class with a padded chair and a beverage and a special treatment. And the application for his illustration was this, uh, God wants all of us to fly first class. I just can't figure out what Bible he's reading. <laughs> because the New Testament that I read Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, so take heart, I've overcome the world. Paul says, it's through many trials and tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. Somehow, we, we haven't learned this very basic lesson that when you sign on to follow Jesus in a walk of obedience, when you say you're gonna walk by faith, you, you expect a certain level of prosperity when the New Testament seems to suggest that you should expect a certain level of adversity. 
And there really are two tests in life, the test of prosperity and the test of adversity. And I believe that the harder test in life often is the test of prosperity because those are the days we walk most in self-reliance. And so we should expect opposition when we walk in the will of God. Number two, we should refuse to play petty tit-for-tat games. Let me give you a verse, it's a spicy one. Proverbs 26, four, thank you, I got one laugh over here. <laughs> Proverbs 26, four, don't respond to the stupidity of a fool, you'll only look foolish yourself. We don't put that on refrigerators these days. It's so true. Have you ever read the Old Testament story of David and Nibal? It's a great, it doesn't get a lot of airtime, but uh, David is uh, frustrated because he's been taking really good of this care of the sheep for this guy named Nibal. And he's been really taking care of him, looking after his guys. And uh, he just wants a little extra food left over after the party. And Nabal tells uh, David's men, it's closed. No help for you. No soup for you, you get it? So he, again, there's a few Seinfeld fans. He tells him, he says, listen, uh, David says, I need about 300, 400 guys to grab swords and come with me. We're gonna kill him. They head toward Nibal. They're going to take this man's life. And of course, for David, this is gonna be disastrous. It's gonna take the favor of God off his life. He's, he's not gonna be walking in the Holy Spirit anymore. And that, that, that of course, you know, there's a reason David prayed, prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He's on the way to have this collision with Nabal, which is going to change the direction of his life and the trajectory of God's blessing. And Abigail intercepts him. Abigail is married to Nabal. She's been married to him for a while. She stops David, bows down, offers to give a gift. And she says this to him, and I paraphrase, don't listen to a word he says, I've been married to him for years. This is not a marriage passage, by the way. I don't encourage that behavior. But she basically says, he's a fool. And you don't want to sacrifice what God's doing in your life and the anointing and the calling and the blessing that God promises to those who walk closely to them. You don't want to act in the flesh here, David. You don't want to do this. And it says that David took his horses and he went home. As I prepared this sermon for this, for this moment, I haven't preached this sermon in 10 years. I, I haven't preached this passage in 10 years. I thought, I wonder if there's somebody here at Houston that needs to be told to take your horses and go home. Let God take care of it. This is not your battle. This is not your war. Get back to doing what God has called you to do. Don't play that game. Nehemiah did that, and he saw God move in a lot of people's lives. Number three, which leads us here finally, remain focused on your calling, on your assignment. Here's good news. At the end of your life, you're gonna have to stand before God and you won't get to hold any hands, not a single one. You won't have your brother, your sister, your mother, your dad, your wife, your child, just you before the judgment seat of the Christ. And the good news about that is you don't have to give an account for your life to anyone but God. He's the only one that matters. You live your life before an audience of one. He's the only one that has the full context of your life. He's the only one that has full con context for your decision-making. Sometimes you make decisions that people criticize, but in your heart, you should say to yourself, if they knew what I knew, they would think what I think. They don't know. But God knows. He's omniscient. He knows. He understands. And my, my hands are clean before him. And so we, we stay focused on the assignment. I'm in Houston, so I feel like I should talk about horses. I don't know anything about horses. I'm just trying to be relevant. Um, but... The thing I've learned about horses this week on Google is that <laughs> there's these, this thing called blinders they put on horses. Did you know about this? They get spooked. And so when they're pulling people down the street, you don't want them looking side to side. So they create these blinders. I actually got a photo of it, Google image. And, and this is to protect you from the horse going nuts over something that's going on the sidewalk. 
And in that Google search, I scrolled down to find the best picture of a horse with blinders so I would be relevant, and I found this. They now make this for humans. <laughs> what a novel idea. We should give these out on Sunday morning to church members and say, don't worry about someone else's Sunday school class. Don't worry about what another church is doing. Don't worry about what other Christians are saying. Why don't we worry about what God's saying? Why don't we worry about what the Holy Spirit's telling us? Maybe we should take a little fast from all those outside voices. Get a journal and a New Testament from Lifeway. <laughs> so I just, you know, snuck that in there. It was sly. First service didn't get that. I'm going to do that again at five. <laughs> the reason I am saying this so passionately today is I really struggle with this. This is all out of a spirit of striving and out of success. If my wife were here today, she'll be here later, she would say, I hope you really heard what that preacher had to say today. <laughs> but here's what I know. When Jesus took Peter after his failure, called him to be a pastor, he's walking with Peter one day and he said, Peter, let me tell you something. One day they're gonna take you where you don't wanna go and they're gonna take your hands and they're gonna stretch you out. He said this to indicate the kind of death that Peter would die. And John 21 tells us that as they're walking, Jesus delivers this very difficult news about adversity. Peter turns around and there's John who calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's a problem in and of itself <laughs> for Peter. And Peter says to Jesus, but what about him? What are you going to make him do? And Jesus says in his own Jesus way, what is that to you? As you look around and you look what other people are doing and you get distracted from the thing that God has called you to do, loving your own kids, pastoring the people in front of you, loving your own spouse, loving your own, your own church, what is all that to you? Lord, I pray for the person in this room that needed to receive this word from Old Testament scripture. Oh God, depression is so easily experienced as we get overwhelmed by the outside voices. Lord, help us to pray that prayer of David. Lord, search me and know me. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Help us to remember the words of Jesus who said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And so for every person in this room that gets distracted by the outside voices, by the criticism, Lord, help them to receive the penetrating truth of criticism, but to reject the lies. God, help our identity. Help us to, to form our identity that is so strong and connected with who you are, Lord, that we don't have to be so worried about who people think we are. And I pray, Lord, for anyone who's just suffered from abuse, emotional or verbal abuse. Someone who, even as I've been speaking, is rehearsing cutting remarks and devastating words that were spoken decades ago. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, give us freedom because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room, whether watching from another campus or online or present here that if there's anyone who realizes they don't have the resources, they don't have the resources to forgive and to forget and to move forward. Lord, I pray that they would, they would call upon you now and become a Christian. That this might be the very motivating moment to lay their lives fully at your feet. And if you're here today and you've never received Christ as your savior, if you're listening, 
it's an opt-in, opt-out thing. It's totally up to you. No one's persuading you, manipulating you. It's your decision. But if you need some help with this and you want to invite in the master who stood before his opponents and was silent, Jesus, you can do that right now. Just pray, Lord Jesus, I invite you in. Give me the power to overcome my past, the power to fly above my critics, the power to pursue the will that you have placed in my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cancel out all my debts. Fill me with the Holy Spirit because of what you did on that cross. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray all these things. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.